for his outstanding academic achievements in defense of historical truth and individual freedom, Premio Bruno Leoni 2015 a Richard Pipes. It's a great, great honor, Mr. Pipes. <laughs> it's a little heavy, so Alessandro will keep it for you during your speech, okay? So, Mr. Pipes, the stage is all yours. I come from the United States, which is supposed to be the most gigantic country in all respects, but I've never eaten a dinner in such large company as this. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I want, first of all, to thank the Bruno Leoni Institute, and particularly its director, Mr. Alberto Mingardi, for the honor of awarding me the Bruno Leoni a prize given for promoting the cause of freedom in theory and in practice. It's the first award I have ever received from an Italian institution. And I shall explain why this is particularly dear to me, because in my life, Italy played a very important role. And I'll begin with explaining you to what happened. Um, I was born and raised in Poland. And I was 16 when, in September 1939, the Germans attacked us. Uh, throughout September, we were bombed day and night, uh, day by Stuka bombers and night by artillery. And it was very difficult uh, to survive this. And uh, at the end of September, the war ended and the Germans took over. We were Polish Jews, and my father was very well informed, unlike many Polish Jews, uh, what was happening in Germany to Jews. Most, strange as it may seem, most Polish Jews were very pro-German. Uh, both I and my wife, as children, were learned, uh, were learned German before we learned Polish, because our parents thought that we, Germany was the country of culture and of business, and we should know that language. <coughs> Excuse me. My father, however, knew very well what was going on. And when the Germans marched in and took over at the beginning of October, <coughs> he said, we cannot live here. We have to leave. And my father knew a South American consul. And he procured us a South American passport on which we left Warsaw on uh, October 27th, 1939. And we, we headed for Italy. We had an Italian uh, visa, uh, visa. When we arrived at, at Salzburg, which was in the border between uh, Germany and, and Italy, the Gestapo men came in and said to us, we cannot enter Italy. We have to go to Berlin to contact our South American consulate or embassy and get a permission from them. Well, we knew this was impossible because our passport was false. I mean, the passport was original, but the, we had no right to it. And my father somehow arranged that we did manage to get across and get to Italy. And we spent the next half a year in Rome and, and partly in Florence. I, at that time, thought of being an art historian. And I studied uh, art, both in Rome and in Florence, where I enrolled at the university as a foreign student. And we, fortunately, my father knew the Polish ambassador, who was still functioning, even though Poland didn't exist anymore. And the Polish ambassador, whom my father knew from the, from the World War I, when he served in the Polish legions, gave us Polish passports on which we applied for American visas. And the American visas arrived uh, just days before Italy entered the war. And, and I've forgotten the exact date, but it was the beginning of June of 1939, for 1940. We left uh, by plane for, uh, it, for Spain, from Spain to Portugal, and from Portugal 
uh, we went by boat to the United States where we arrived on my 17th birthday uh, in July 1940. But I've always had a very, very warm feeling for, for Italy because it really saved our lives. If we didn't have the entry to, to, uh, to Italy in 39, we would have perished in the Holocaust. And it is, to a large extent, my experiences in, uh, in, the, in the World War II that made me very conscious of the value of liberty and the value of property as an instrument of liberty. Uh, and uh, I gave up when the war was over and I went to college in the United States. I gave up my idea of studying and writing about uh, art history and devoted myself to Russian history because it seemed to me that the experiences we, we had with Germany were to a very large extent originally conceived and, bo and, and born in the Soviet Union. So I became a doctorate in Russian history and began to write books on the subject. I, I have to my name 24 books of which property and freedom is one. Uh, the thing that struck me is how in Russia, Tsarist Russia, the absence of property uh, plays such an enormous role in, uh, in, in enforcing uh, autocracy. Believe it or not, this is not generally known, in Russia until the very end of the 18th century, uh, there was no private property in land. All the land in Russia belonged to the Tsars. Russia was what Max Weber called a patrimonial country in which the Tsar owned all the productive resources uh, of the country. Um, and uh, that fact made Russia a very autocratic state. At the until then, uh, no, no, nobles could only own, uh, not, not own, but hold land and conditional service to the state. If they served the state, they could hold the land. The moment they stopped serving the, the state, they lost the land. The land was taken It was not the property. It could not be inherited by the children, unless the children also served. And that was the basis of the autocratic system in Russia and the basis of uh, autocratic systems all over the world, including later on the Soviet Union and so on. At the very uh, end of the 18th century, or I should say in, in the middle of the 18th century, Russia exempted the nobility from state service and in 1785 gave him the land in private property. And throughout the 19th century, uh, private property developed and when the revolution occurred, uh, there was a great deal of private property which the Bolsheviks immediately abolished. Uh, all the land, all the factories, all the productive wealth became the ownership of the, the state, but in fact of the party, the Bolshevik party. And that uh, inculcated in me the idea that if we want to have liberty, we must have private property because we have an example in England. In England, private property existed already in the Middle Ages, in the 13th century. And what was the result of that? The English monarchy had to convene, in the, I think it was the 13th century, the House of Commons, because it didn't have enough money. And it had to get the money from the public. And it became increasingly dependent on the public, and England became eventually a, a model democracy. Therefore, and of course, this is very true of the United States. The, the, the idea occurred to me, and that's why I wrote the book, Property and Freedom, which we are celebrating to some extent here today, tonight, uh, that you cannot have liberty and issue of property, because property is where the power of the state stops. And I very much hope that this idea will spread. It's not a very popular idea. My book was criticized as being very right-wing, very conservative, which really isn't. But I think that the idea that property is essential to liberty will spread uh, from the West, Western Europe, to the rest 
of Asia and Latin America and, and China too. Today, China, though it's an autocratic state, has private property, and that strongly limits the power of the state. So private property is essential to liberty, and I hope you will accept this notion, and I hope eventually it will become commonplace in the rest of the world. Thank you very much.